So within Westview, if Wanda had like one of her neighbors commit a crime, could they be morally responsible? And intuitively, I'm like, I don't think so. But I wanted to ask the the free will guys, like, what? Wh how do we analyze this? What do we think? Um, yeah, just jump off on that. I, I, Taylor and I were talking about this earlier. I think one of the things that you have to be clear about is what you mean by manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can think about it like a scale with rational persuasion on one end um, where you're giving somebody good logical reasons to do something or believe something. And then on the other thing, or the other end, things like coercion, mm -hmm. um, where coercion seems to work against your will. Um, manipulation falls somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. where it's not going against your will. It's actually changing your will from the inside. Hmm. Um, so Robert Kane has written a lot about free will. He talks about this distinction between manipulation and coercion. Um, and it's not clear that the people of Westview are, what are they manipulated or are they coerced? Because in some of the scenes, um, it seems like they might actually be a kind of coercion from the inside. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like they're acting against their will, which is why when Vision kind of lets the real character out, they 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 show that they're being like, I don't know, they feel like a puppet or something like that. They're not really yeah. doing what they want. So their their will is being like overridden, and they're being yeah, it's like they're they're being suppressed. Their true identity is being suppressed. I think they probably even have different names, right? Didn't they say like my name's Sarah or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so you guys would say that's that's coercion, and coercion's a stronger thing than manipulation would be. Yeah, in most cases, if you think about the, the, like a typical case of coercion where somebody puts a gun up to your head and like, give me all your money, or if you're working at the bank, we don't we don't hold bank tellers responsible for giving away the bank's money to a gunman. Um, it's kind of excused in that yeah. in that sense. So I, you know, I'm I'm not going to blame somebody or hold them responsible if they're being coerced. Okay, so how about if um if that bank robber comes in and uh, the guy, whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good case here. How about if that bank robber, instead of going in with a gun, um, says like, I have your kid hostage. And if you don't uh, delete a bunch of the, this money out of this account and then slip it to me out the back door, then I'm going to kill your kid or something terrible. Um, is, is that coercion or is that manipulation? And do we hold the, the teller responsible in that case? It's Seems like ahead, yeah, it seems like yeah. It seems like coercion to me. Okay. It's something external to your will making one option way more attractive than it would have been initially. So like you wouldn't want to give the money away, but when the the alternative to that is your kid getting hurt or, or killed, then now the option of giving the money away looks pretty good in by comparison. So maybe it's worth having like a I don't know clean case of manipulation to contrast that yeah. with. Let's do it. My favorite case is from uh, someone who was Matt's advisor, my advisor for my master's, Al Mealy. It's the case of Anne and Beth. So Anne and Beth are both academics. I guess they're both philosophers. Um, Anne is incredibly industrious. She works, I don't know, 80 hours a week. She's constantly cranking out publications. She's a great teacher, all that. Um, Beth is a good teacher. She does some research, but she has a lot of hobbies. She spends her time on other things besides her work, but their dean wants Beth to be more like Anne. And so what he does is he hires a team of neuroscientists and psychologists to go and tinker with Beth's brain uh, while she's asleep without her knowing. And so the result is they take basically the uh, psychological profile of Anne and copy that and paste it in Beth. So the next morning, Beth has no idea what's happened, but she wakes up really wanting to go to work, really wanting to spend extra time at work. And, you know, she'll stay, she'll stay as later than she normally would, thanks to her new psychological profile. Now, when she does this activity, like staying late at work to review an extra paper or something like that, um, she's doing it willingly, but it's because her will has been affected by the neuroscientists and psychologists who've tinkered with her. So that's a case where she's been manipulated covertly um, to have a new kind of character or value profile. Okay. Okay. So uh, there's this distinction that I picked up. I think, yeah, this is from Guillaume Bignon. And he, he talks about, uh, he, he, he parses manipulation as uh, 
influencing manipulation and overriding manipulation. I don't know if this is original, Tim. Have you guys ever heard this before? Maybe it's not original, Tim. I think it's tracking what people have been saying in the literature, but I don't, it, he might have made up those terms, okay. given, given those names to it. Yeah. So, I, so, so yeah. I've been thinking about, I watched that episode with, with Guillaume, and I think what, what it might track is actually the way manipulation is used in different fields of study. Hmm. So uh, in the free will literature, we talk about manipulation in a, in a, in a way. And also in the ethics manipulation, in, in the ethics literature, they talk about manipulation in a slightly different way. So um, like in bioethics and applied ethics, we there, there's a lot of literature about manipulation. And I think it actually might track with what, what Guillaume's talking about um, with whether the manipulation like will guarantee the behavior or if it's just kind of like a, a nudge or mm -hmm. some kind of influence that's you know, less than a guarantee. Yeah. So I, I, that sounds great. So like uh, the, the influencing manipulation might track with like the ethics view mm -hmm. where you're, you're, you are coerced. Um, it's so hard. All these, all the, all the <laughs> terms are so loaded, but it's like, that's the, uh, the teller being uh, blackmailed or, you know, uh, threatening note. And you're, you are still going through the victim's mind. You're still like presenting a reason to them, but it's not, uh, it's an argument. It's like a force of threat or, or something like that. Whereas the overriding manipulation is what I think of with like, um, yeah, Taylor, the case you brought up from Mealy or the uh, evil scientist uh, putting a chip in your brain. Does does that make sense? Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think even in the in the applied ethics literature and in the literature on nudges, it need not be a threat, a coercive threat that counts as the manipulation. It could mm -hmm. even be something as simple as um, an influence from advertising or something like that. Okay. But that, the, 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 what's interesting is in the free will literature, people usually set those cases aside and they do the, mm -hmm. they talk about the overriding covert cases of manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Ann Beth case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 